All right, <clears throat> my name is Brian Dalpiz. I'm a math instructor here at Spoon River College. I have been for over a quarter of a century now. Uh, college theme this year is Curiosity, Inquiring Minds Want to Learn. Uh, the title of mine is Infinite Exposure. It was either that or uh, Useless Math, but I thought, I don't, I don't want to diss on math and I don't want to uh, use math in the title because I figure people might not show up. So. <clears throat> All right, human beings are naturally curious. Uh, from a very early age. What's the favorite question all kids like to ask? Why? Why, exactly. Hopefully we have sound here. My son is three years old. It's an amazing guy with a big head, a little tiny body. It's an outrageous time when they ask you about everything. It's like, why is the sky blue? Well, because of the atmosphere. Why is there atmosphere? Well, because we need to breathe. Why do we breathe? Well, I fucking want to know! <laughs> Uh, we're naturally curious. Uh, we seek to understand. Curiosity is really a desire to understand. Um, our mathematical minds look for patterns. Every time you're looking for a pattern, that's the math part of your brain working. You say you're not a math person, we're all math people. Just a matter of how much we use it. Uh, for instance, look at those numbers right there. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21. What's the pattern? What comes next? 24, 27, and 30. That one's a pretty easy one to recognize, right? 24, 27, 30. Of course, you might remember the song, too. 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, 30. Okay, now we're going to count them all the way down. Anybody remember that? Yes. Schoolhouse Rocks. What about that sequence? Anybody see the pattern? They get bigger. They get bigger. That's good. Yeah, that's a pattern. They get bigger. It's not the pattern. It's a pattern. But yeah, in order, that one's a little bit more complicated. This would be like a degree one level of difficulty. This is a degree three level of difficulty. Why is it degree three? Well, if you look at successive differences, like zero and three, they're three apart. Three and 14, they're 11 apart. 14 and 39, 25 apart. If I keep doing that, there's the differences. Still probably don't see a path, right? It looks kind of like random numbers are still getting bigger. They're still getting bigger. Do it again. You might start to see a pattern now. Some of you may see it, some may not. But if I go one more, even Dr. Kirk can figure this one out, right? All sixes, that's the pattern. So there is a pattern of those. They look kind of chaotic, but there is a path. Uh, even from an early age, yes, we ask why a lot. But even as we get older, we still are curious about lots of things, just like Robert Barone from Everybody Loves Rain. You ever think about space? <laughs> what is it? Is it really endless? I mean, if you have a spaceship, could you go fly and fly through space forever? Why don't you give it a shot? <laughs> I mean, how can space go on forever? And if it doesn't, then what's at the end? Stop it, Robbie. You give yourself a tummy ache. <laughs> what about the beginning of time? What was it before that? Before time? Nothing. I mean, what is nothing? How could there be nothing? This doesn't bother anybody else. <laughs> anybody have thoughts like that? Like, how could this be? Eventually, you arrive at a contradiction, no matter what you think, what you believe. Uh, kind of frustrating. One person who was really interested in space was Galileo, a long time ago. He was interested in what made the, the moon go around the earth. He was interested in, in all of the planets and all of the stars, trying to make, see patterns in what he was looking at through his telescope. He was interested in why objects of different size fell at the same rate. Um, he didn't realize that those two things are actually connected. It wasn't until uh, Newton came along, so Galileo understood what was happening, but he didn't really understand why. It wasn't until Newton came along, and Newton, by the way, was born the same year Galileo died. So if you believe in reincarnation, perhaps it's the same person. Um, <clears throat> Isaac Newton was curious about lots of things, including what made the moon orbit the earth and what made objects fall as well. And he actually created a thought experiment that made him realize it's one and the same thing. Just picture shooting a cannon from a very high mountain. And if you shoot it fast enough, shoot the cannonball fast enough, it will keep falling forever, which really is putting it into orbit around the Earth. 
And so he realized objects falling on Earth and the moon orbiting the Earth are all being, uh, are all the results of the same thing, and that is what? Gravity. Gravity is what's doing it. So he faced a little bit of backlash because he didn't say what gravity was, but he figured out uh, what was causing it, and he created a mathematics that could help him figure this stuff out and find all of his laws of motion, and it was a mathematics based on the infinity principle. It's been known as the infinity principle, and that's calculus, and then calculus produced physics. He has a good quote that I want to read to you here. Um, he realized his accomplishments would not have been possible without the the curiosity and discoveries of his predecessors, of his predecessors, such as Galileo. He's quoted as saying, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Again, he didn't really know what gravity was, he just knew how it worked. And then came Einstein. And he started looking at things through thought experiments again, because it's the only way you can study the kind of stuff he was thinking about, is in your own mind. And that takes a hell of a lot of creativity, by the way. A lot of people think math is like a robot. There's all kinds of creativity to actually solve problems. So he started thinking about the concept of time itself and came to the conclusion that space and time are intertwined in a fabric known as the space-time fabric. And what gravity was is just a warping of space-time, and that's what's causing the moon to go around the Earth and the Earth to go around the sun and all of that. It's all just warping space-time. The bigger the mass, the more it warps space-time, the more the gravitational pull is. All right. <clears throat> A lot of, this is all math developed to try to explain things that people were seeing, but a lot of math was developed without any known application, just for the fun of it, just for the nerdiness of it, just for the curiosity. For instance, square root of negative one, what is that equal to? Nobody's going to answer. Come on, some of you know. I've had some of you in class. What is it? I. I. It's I, right? It's defined as I. How can you have a square root of negative one? That doesn't make any sense. So mathematicians played around with it and came up with a whole new axis and the complex plane, the concept of complex numbers, uh, what, what happens when we add them, subtract them, multiply them, what other stuff's going on, how can they solve certain polynomial equations? Didn't think there was any use for it at all. In fact, Rene Descartes said that these are completely useless numbers, they're not real, you can't apply them, and so that's where the term imaginary comes from. Rene Descartes coined that term, imaginary for these. But as it turns out, of course, in Rene Descartes' defense, there was no electricity harnessed yet at his time. There were no signals, satellite signals, or anything else. But it does apply to the study of electricity. It applies to digital signal processing and lots of other things. So, in fact, Rene Descartes... Oh, sound Damn it. Back in trade. There we go. He's wrong. There. He's wrong again. One more time. Okay. Another example of math that was thought to be kind of just for fun early on, uh, the Konigsberg Bridges. The idea was, is there any one path that crosses all bridges only one time, that crosses all the bridges? And it was kind of a conundrum. People were like, well, I can't find one that works, but does that mean there's none that would work? It was Leonard Euler who came along and used logic and created a method that would show for sure there was no way that it would work. Uh, and that was the birth of what's known as graph theory. Uh, graph theory at, at the time, you just thought this is just simple logic, putting it down into symbols, not anything really important. But that's actually grown into a whole field of mathematics that's used for things like studying the internet and social media and purchasing YouTube viewers, um, routing packages in different boxes from UPS, FedEx. <clears throat> also studying the, the workings of your neural networks in the brain. So there is application. Starts from just curiosity, turns out to have applications. Uh, another example, knot theory. So the study of knots. Originally it was just curiosity caused mathematicians to kind of play around with different types of knots and how they might be able to be used um, for certain types of things that you're wanting to tie. But other than that, no real application. The, the nerdy, nerdiness in them had to actually classify the different types of knots. No practical application whatsoever until uh, researchers have found that knots is what viruses do to DNA of cells. They tie knots in the DNA. And so it turns out all of this useless math that people have developed is quite useful in our study of viruses uh, and how they work. Another perfect example is number theory. Studying numbers and just their interrelationships, just studying numbers for the sake of numbers. You've got Pascal's triangle here, 
Prime numbers is of special interest to number theorists. No practical application early on, but, well, in fact, it dates way back. This is an ancient tablet. Uh, not sure how ancient it is. You need to call in an archaeologist to figure this one out, so. Call on Dr. Jones here to help us out. This is actually a 4,000-year-old clay tablet from ancient Babylonians. And once they figured out what, it was, what was on it, these are lists of Pythagorean triples. Uh, Pythagorean from the Pythagorean theorem, named after Pythagoras, even though Pythagoras was actually alive 2,500 years ago, whereas the tablet was 4,000 years ago. So, you know, find it and claim it as your own, I guess. <laughs> now, oh yeah, uh, number three, Alan Turing. Anybody know who Alan Turing is? There was a whole movie about him. Right, he created the Turing machine, broke the Nazi code, helped us win World War II. Very important. He used concepts of number theory to do that. Now it's involved in computer calculations, so they can calculate uh, vast, enormous quantities very quickly and efficiently. Uh, it's also used for cybersecurity. Prime numbers, large prime numbers, very important for cybersecurity, keeping everything secure on the internet, on your computers. So there's some people who will say math is useless. <laughs> Recognize that face? <laughs> some people think math is useless, but those people are. <laughs> Come on. There we go. We've got to do that a few more times. Wrong. Wrong. Another area of useless mathematics would be fractals. And I put useless in quotes, by the way. The idea of a fractal is an object that is self-similar uh, with a pattern for duplicating itself infinitely many times. So here's some examples of fractals. You see this one's kind of morphing over here. Uh, but you can just keep zooming in and zooming in infinitely many times, on out to infinity, and it's just going to keep repeating the same pattern. So how exactly does that work? Well, let's look at an example where we start with a triangle. If I break each of the line segments, take the middle third out of it, and put a point there, the same size as the other points, after one iteration, it looks like that. After another, it looks like that. And you just keep doing it again and again forever, <laughs> infinitely many times. This is known as the Koch snowflake. It's a, a specially named fractal. And again, if you just keep zooming in more and more, it just keeps repeating the same thing. So it's like you're looking at it with a microscope, and what you see at the macro, you see at the micro. It just keeps repeating through that regenerative process. So they're self-similar, and they're infinite. The man who discovered fractals and first wrote about it is Benoit Mandelbrot. Uh, this happened pretty recently in the past, you know, the 1970s. Like all of us young people born in the 1970s, fractals were born in the 1970s. Uh, this is the book, the first book he, put, he published on fractals. And this is his famous fractal known as the Mandelbrot set. And this complicated looking thing all comes from this simple looking equation. It's an iterative process. Can't go obviously go into the details here. Calc students have seen some of the details of this. But. So there's your Mandelbrot set. And if you zoom in on the Mandelbrot set, is that really self similar? Well, there's all kinds of neat configurations there. But this is actually produced in the complex plane. Back to imaginary numbers again. This is the complex plane and what it produces. And you can see as you zoom in far enough, you're going to see another little baby Mandelbrot set in there. It continues forever. The further you zoom in, the deeper you dig, um, the more it exposes what lies beneath. Let's look at a tree fractal here, for instance. Talking about the self-similarity. If you zoom in on just this piece, it's going to look just like the original. And you ever see anything like that in nature? Well, trees kind of behave like this, the way they branch. So these are pictures where you're zooming in on, there's a little box, you can't really see it. There's a box here, if you zoom in, it looks like this. There's a box here, if you zoom in, this is exactly the same. This is all mathematically created here. This is what appears in nature. So you can see the self-similarity is apparent in all around us in nature. Uh, branching is, is one of the most common forms of fractals you'll see. Natural, fractal, natural with a tree. Even if you look at the structure of our veins and arteries in our body, they branch out the same way trees branch out. Uh, our lungs, the 
brachial tubes within our lungs, the way they branch. This is fractal down here. This is actual pictures of, of configurations of lungs. <clears throat> this is known as the Barnsley fern fractal. Here are actual fern leaves. So fractal, this is all mathematically generated. This is actual picture of fern leaves. This is called the cones on cones fractal which looks a lot like Romanesco broccoli. This is actual broccoli. It's type of broccoli right there. It looks almost identical, right? Completely generated through math. It makes you think, does nature just work with a bunch of mathematical formulas? Are you all just a mathematical formula? There's the Coke snowflake we saw earlier. There's a regular snowflake. This is a frost fractal. This was entirely generated through mathematical formulas. This is a graph you're looking at right there. There's actual frost on a window. There's Mandelbrot set. This is lightning. If you zoom in on a different part of the Mandelbrot set, it looks like this. There's actual lightning. There's a spiral from the Mandelbrot set. There's a spiral of the galaxy. So, makes you wonder. There's something happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear. Well, we have time, so <laughs> move on to the next slide here. Maybe. All right. So we're getting into some application now. So those are all the ways you can kind of see similarities in the real world along with the mathematical fractals we're talking about. So in what ways are fractals applied? I just have five examples right here. Uh, movie special effects. Here you see using triangles to generate a mountain scenery and now to generate a whole planet in Star Trek. Uh, here you Star Wars. You've got the lava scene from Star Wars. Fractals are all around there. They're using that to create the lava and the special effects there. Uh, every cell phone, every smartphone you have has a fractal antenna inside it. If it didn't have a fractal antenna, it would have to have all these different sizes and lengths antennas coming out of them. But the fractal design allows it to pick up different frequencies and do a lot of things at once. You know, there are a lot of functions. There you go. That's what your cell phone would look like if it had didn't have a fractal antenna in it. Uh, the rhythms of the heart, studying the human heartbeat. Turns out the human heartbeat, it's not just constantly at a certain rate, it's actually fractal in its pattern. It's self-similar. If you zoom in on it, it produces similar patterns throughout. If you don't have a fractal heartbeat, that's a sign that maybe something's wrong. And so they can detect just from your heartbeat if there might be something wrong with your heart. Studying the weather, forecasting the weather. Something that would be really good to do when you have extreme weather and being able to warn people beforehand or maybe what can we do to maybe change some of the weather patterns, you know, with climate change. Fractals are used to help study and better understand the way weather behaves. <clears throat> blood flow into our organs. Uh, turns out blood flow into organs, just like the branching of our uh, veins and arteries, uh, it's fractal in nature. Nice and geometric and symmetric and fractal. Whereas a cancerous tumor, it's not. And so they could use just ultrasound to possibly identify tumors way earlier where you can fight it, have a very high success rate um, using fractals, using the concept of fractals. Oh, no, no, I don't understand. <laughs> okay, so curiosity motivates learning. Learning exposes some truths, but even more questions. And the cycle continues. Like a fractal, the pattern is self-similar and infinite. As wise Jedi Obi-Wan Dagoki once said, <laughs> I don't know how loud this will be. There is no cure. You are afflicted with it once you've got it for the rest of your life. In case you didn't catch this, there is no cure for curiosity. You are afflicted with it once you've got it for the rest of your life. So may the force of curiosity be with you always. Thank you. Nineteen minutes. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I don't know. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Don't have a lot of time. Isn't the earth flat? Say what? Isn't the earth flat? Yeah, sure, Kyrie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks for coming, everybody.